Okay, so let's go ahead and and start. So um, today, what we're going to do is a few more data path and control signal diagrams. Okay, uh, namely these three instructions here. Um, when we get to the load instruction, that's the one that's really interesting because I've been saying, you know, for quite a while now that most of the real instructions take two clock cycles, but you know, there's some instructions that take three. Well, when we get to the load instructions, you'll start to see the instructions that take three clock cycles and why that's so. Okay. Uh, but we're going to start off with these two that we haven't done in SW and then KUI PC. So just like when we did the data path and control diagrams for uh, previous instructions, it's a good idea to have the instruction manual handy. Okay, so you can look at the instruction and the description as we go through it. I've been making some mistakes today um, in my earlier section, not intentional. I don't know, I'm just having a bad day. So uh, keep that on me because uh, if I miss something or make a mistake, don't be shy and, and let me know. I, I, I'm not doing it intentionally. It's just like I said, I'm having a bad day. I guess. I'm just making some stupid mistakes. I'm probably so keep an eye out for that. Uh, so anyway, after we go through these diagrams, and the reason I put, I think it's eight diagrams, okay? I put eight hard copies of these auto diagrams on each table, two per person. The reason I did that is because these two instructions I do not have on Canvas. They, uh, you know, all the other instructions prior to today that I did in class, they're also on Canvas. Uh, this load instruction, the third instruction we'll do, that one is on Canvas. So yeah. my hope is that you'll fill out for these two instructions that aren't on Canvas, you'll fill those out here in class. And you'll have them. Okay, so after we're done with these diagrams, we're going to talk about a timing diagram. And I have a timing diagram for an example program okay, that I made up that we'll talk about. And after I talk about this example timing diagram, the activity today Okay, sent everybody an email about there being a class activity today. Uh, the class activity will be, you know, as a group coming up with the timing diagram for hardware six. Okay, um, hardware six. Yeah, there's some extra hard copies here. So if you don't have all what you need, you can come up here and get it. Hardware six has a sample program of six instructions. So, you know, once we go through this example, you should be able to come up with the timing diagram for that hardware six sample program. And you'll need that because when you model your otter, you know, you connect up all your uh, modules together and you run that sample program on Bovado. Well, the only way you'll know whether, you know, your otter is actually running that program correctly is by looking at the simulation timing diagram on Bovado. And, you know, by doing this class activity, you'll have something to refer to, right? Because as long as you do the timing diagram today correctly, well, if your timing diagram from Bovado matches what you do in class today, well, that means your uh, hardware six is good. Um, Dr. Hummel also made a video where he shows the simulation for hardware six, and I put that video on our canvas, so you can look at that video too. Okay, so anyway, that's, that's the agenda. We're gonna start with some diagrams. Okay, data path control, and then um, look at timing diagrams. Okay. All right. So let's start with this first instruction here. SW two comma zero in parentheses S zero. So first of all, what instruction is this? Store work. All right. So store work. And what is the T two referring to? Now again, you should have your instruction manual. You know online, I don't think most of you have a hard copy like this. I think I've only seen one student with a hard copy like me. Everybody else uses the computer, which is fine. Okay, but looking at the detailed description, what is uh, T2 referring to? Is that a source register, a destination register, or what? 
Is it destination? Are you looking at your descriptions? Your instruction manual? Yeah, it's RS2. Now, for some instructions, that's the destination register. But not for this. Okay, so this is RS2. Okay, how about S0? What's that? RS1. And and what's this zero in front of the parentheses? That's immediate. Then what type of immediate does the store word instruction have? That's the right. Yeah. Right. This, this is all coming from the detailed description of that instruction. That's what I'm looking at. Okay, now. Also, I don't think I had enough of these for each table, but most tables have, from the instruction manual, they have that sheet that shows you the alternative register names for the reg files. Um, if you don't have it on your table, again, you can see it on Canvas. T2, that's the alternative name for which register? Which one is it? Yep, it's seven. And how about F0? That's the alternate name for what register? I'd say F. And then also for this um, example, we're going to say that the contents of T2, which again is register 7, is hex 66. And the contents of F0, which is uh, the alternate name for register 8, is hex 6000. Okay. So what does this instruction do? The store word, what does it do? You use this instruction, right? You do you use store word. I think you use store half word. Stores the contents of register eight, register seven. Uh, uh, are we looking at our description? Because the description will tell you. There's the contents of that seven to uh, X, well, X, H, and then by X, zero. So I think that we need to use the shift of the address functions. Okay, well, it, it takes the contents of register seven, and where does it put it? Like, what is the instruction treat this as? It's the well, X, zero, the address, so the immediate is going to get to the address. Okay, yeah, so. The way this instruction works is that it will add the immediate to the contents of this register, and then it uses this as a red as an address. So it's going to take the contents of this register and store it at this address. Okay, you've used this right because you've used this in programs where. In this register here, originally you put in, say, the switch address because you were using like a load command, right? Like a load word or load half word at the beginning of your program. And then at the end, when you were outputting to like the seven segment or the LEDs, you would put an offset here, right? Because the switches are at address 11, all zeros, and the LEDs are at address 11, four zeros, two zero. So for example, you put two zero here and you have the address of the switch is already in this uh, register. So this would add the 20 to the 11 all zeros, which is the address of the LEDs. And then it would take the contents of this register and send it to the LEDs. Okay, so it's taking the contents of this register and storing it at this address. Okay, does everybody remember? Because you've used this, right? Okay, we just didn't do a data path and control signal a diagram for it, but you've used it in a program. All right, so let's go ahead now and let's fill out the diagram. So I'm gonna use red for data and blue for control, just like we did previously. So when we're doing these uh, diagrams, where do we always start? Where have I always started? The output of the program counter? Yeah, the output of the program counter, because what's at the output of the program counter? The address of the instruction to be executed, right? So that's where we're going to start. Okay, so the address of the instruction to be executed 
comes out of the program counter output. It goes to this address one of our memory module. Remember, the memory module that has real memory, right? Real memory is made out of the code segment, the data segment, the stack segment, right? The instructions are in the code segment. So what do we want to make happen here? Now that we have that address of the instruction to be executed, what's the next thing we want to make happen? The address, what you want to do. We are going to write the memory at some point, but unlike the first block, uh, not yet. So we get with the right content for the right time. The problem is going to go to the house and have a location instead of next state. Okay, well, you're getting a little farther ahead. Let's wait. Let's wait to talk about the reg file. We're we're still here. It is able as one has to be a one. Right, and why does it have to be a one? It's active high. It's active high, and then by it being active high, and and is it a synchronous or asynchronous uh, read? Synchronous. Yeah. Remember, all our reads are synchronous except for the reg file reads. Those are the only asynchronous reads. And then all the writes are asynchronous, okay? So this is a synchronous read, so we want, and it's active high, like you said. So we want to make it a one. And then when we get a clock head, right? With this being one, and then we get a clock head from the pair one, what's going to happen at the time of that clock head? With this being one. Yeah, what's going to be here? Uh, the data has that address. Which is what? Instruction. An instruction, right? So the program counter is outputting the address of the instruction to be executed. We make memory read one active with the one at the time of the one to zero, uh, zero to one transition to the clock. At that time, now the instruction at the address will be at the L1. Okay. Okay. Everybody remember that? We've gone over that before. Okay. So now we have the instruction at out one our memory module now let's talk about the reg file okay so for this instruction does rf1 which address is that address one does that matter yeah because we have an rs1 in this instruction so that input matters and what's going to be the data on that input? just seven it's rs1 eight right gonna be eight See, that's why we need to write the non-alternative name of the reg file register because the alternate non-alternative name that gives you the actual number of the register and the number is the address. Okay, so yeah, you'll have an eight here. Does the address two matter for this instruction? Yeah, you got an RS two. So what's going to be the data at address two? That's going to be seven. Okay, now we wouldn't put X7 because when we put X7, that refers to the contents of the register. Okay, the address is just the number. Okay. okay, we have an immediate. So, well, do we care about WA, a right address for this instruction? No, because there's no destination register. Right? If you don't have a destination register, then that WA address input doesn't matter. Okay. But the immediate generator matters, right? So if we have an immediate. And as you said earlier, it's an S type of media. So that's where the zero is going to be. You can see that goes to this input of uh, this box here. Um, at the output of RS1, you see RS1, that's S0. And we were told the contents of that register is X6000. So we're going to have our X6000 at the output of uh, RS1. And then what's going to be at the output of RS2? Uh, RS2 is register P2. Right. That's the contents of T2, which is uh, register 7. That's going to be at the output of RS2. Okay, so this data 
the hex 6000 comes over to this mux. And what do we want to happen between this immediate and the contents of this register S0? Yeah, we want to add them together. And where does mathematical operations take place? What piece of hardware? ALU. So we got to take in that hex 6000 along with that S type of immediate of zero, bring them into the ALU for the addition tab, right? So what do we have to make? This select line of this month, so that ALU source A. Gonna make that zero. Okay, so now we're gonna have that X6000 at the source A input of the ALU. Um, how about this month down here, ALU source B? What does that have to equal? Two. So that's gonna connect to that S type. To the output, which is zero in this case. Then the addition is going to happen. Well, the addition is going to happen provided what? What else do I have to do? Okay. So we missed the signal over in the red file. We missed the enable for that. Oh, wait, are you talking about this? Does it matter? Uh, well, let's see. For this instruction, yeah, it won't matter. But even if it did, like say we were writing to a destination register, we would wait until we get to this point. We're not there anyway. But yeah, you'll see that's not part of this instruction. Okay, but in order for the ALU to do the addition, what do we have to have here? Um, the ALU fun has to be what? Yeah. Has to be all zero. And again, you get that from the table that's on the diagram, right? That the add function will happen for the ALU when ALU fun is all zeros. Okay, so this is all zeros. So the addition takes place, and since we're just adding the zero, right, we're just going to get a hex 6,000 here. Okay, so this now is going to come up and come over to this address input of our memory module. And then this hex 66, our data, that's going to go up here. Going to be in two of our memory module, right? So that's the first time you've seen these inputs of the memory module being used. See, they're there for a store command like this. And we're going to make, see, we're taking the data at DN2, which is the hex 66. We're taking that data and we want to write it to this address. We want to write it to address 6000. So see how the memory module has this write, this WE2 stands for write to, and it's an active high. So if we make that one on the zero to one transition of the clock, after this becomes one, that's when the data, this x 66 in this case, will be written to address 6000. And what's the significance of address 6000? Where have you seen address 6000? So the data. Yeah, that's the first address of the data type, right? So this, this instruction would be taking the contents of this register and sending it to the data segment, specifically address 6000 of the data segment. Now, as I said earlier, you use this command, you know, this instruction earlier to send data to, you know, either the LEDs or the seven sec. So, you know, if you're using it for that purpose, well, now this address would be 11.00020 for the LEDs and 11.00040 for the seven segment. Okay, now we're not quite done because just like with other instructions we've done, also part of this diagram is showing the data path and the control signals to get ready for the next instruction at the exit. Right? So, since we're not jumping or we're not branching, right, we're just going to increment by four in address, right, to go to the next instruction in the program. So, what would we want PC source to keep? Right? Because that's going to take this input of the months that has um, address plus four, right, to go to the next instruction in our program. 
And then what else do we need to have some good? Yeah, PC right, it's gotta be a one, right? Because that will take this new address now and put it at the output of the program, right? And then let's compute the next year. Okay, so are there any questions? I don't think we missed anything, right? I don't know. We got all the control signals in there. So so again, Grady, right? It's Grady. Yeah. yeah, see, this instruction doesn't involve writing to the reg file. So yeah, it doesn't matter about what's right for this instruction. Yeah. Okay. All right. So if there's no questions on oops, when does RS2 go into the MUPS? When does RS2 go into the MUPS? Well, these both these outputs, RS1 and RS2, they're asynchronous. So as soon as these addresses, you know, as soon as this is an eight, you're going to have the contents of that registry. As soon as that's a seven, you're going to have the contents of seven. So it doesn't have to, like it doesn't go into that much. Oh, okay. Well, remember that whatever is on this output, you know, it's going to this box. It's going over to, you know, what we have over here. But it's just for this instruction, whatever's here doesn't matter because we're choosing with this instruction, we're choosing this input to be at the output. So it doesn't matter what these other inputs are. There's data there, there's zeros and ones there, but for this instruction, it doesn't matter. So we don't care. Like you'll see when we get to the timing diagrams, when you look at a timing diagram on the bottom, you're gonna have a bunch of signals all taking up a lot of data. But you know, if all those signals, you're only interested for any particular instruction, you're only interested in a, in you know maybe a half dozen of them there or so. You know, that's why, like in uh, Dr. Hummel's video, he shows how you can uh, like group signals together. Like you can say, oh, these are you know the signals coming out of a certain place or going into a certain place, and when you group them, you can easily um, like hide them. So if, if that instruction doesn't involve those signals, you can just hide them and it makes it easier to look at your timing diagram because then on the timing diagram are only the signals that matter for that particular instruction. You had a question? Yeah, uh, I was gonna ask what it says, like for the number after the red file, the number after the LU that is not. Oh, you're talking about this? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, coming out of this RS1 out to the reg file, that's the hex 6000, okay? Because that's uh, that's the contents of S0, which is register eight. So we see we put the address eight, and now the contents of that register is gonna be here. And that's what the hex 6000 is. And then the hex 66, that's the contents of register seven. Is that what you're asking? And, and again, we, we were just told what that was here as an example. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I just can't see what it looks like. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's. I mean, I'm kind of limited how uh how you can, but you know, you can always like move your chair. If you want to move your chair to the top of that table or over here, so you can see better. Okay. Yeah, you know, if people are having trouble seeing the board, you can move around. I don't mind if you move, especially when we get to the timing diagram later, like people on this side of the room, I would think would want to move over here because it's going to be nearly impossible, if not impossible to see. So don't feel like you have to be anchored to your seat. You can move around. All right. So any more questions? Because if not, I'm going to erase this for the next one. Okay. Oh, oh, oh okay. Let me put the two down. Yeah, if you want to take a picture, take a picture. Okay, is it all right if I erase now? Okay. All right, so we got, we got this one done. We got two more to go. So does everybody hear about the cold weather that's coming? It's gonna be like 40 degrees, they're saying. 
They say it may snow in the quest degree. I doubt we're not they said the snow level is going to be 1100 feet. I guess quest degree at the highest point is like 1700. Somebody was saying, I don't know if that's true. Oh, Okay, so hopefully I'm getting all this. If I miss something, let me know. Okay. Did I miss anything? Did I miss any blue number? You get everything. Okay, so did I, did I miss anything? I think you got everything. Do they look good? Thumbs up. All right. Are you ready for the next instruction? This AUI PC. So, what instruction is this? Oh, wait. I think you have something on the month, so it shouldn't be there for the, for the right data of the right files. Uh, Mucks. No, 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 for right data. Uh, the right, right data. Right 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 so yeah, the on top of the uh, oh, this? Yeah, that's a hard, yeah, but I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to mention. This input to this MUX one, and also notice over here, these two inputs to the MUX for the program counter, I've got them connected to zero, and that's because if you look at where these are connected to, they're connected to things that have to do with interrupts. And like I've said many times before, we're not going to have time for an interrupt. So, you know, for your program counter, these two inputs, you can just connect to zero. And same thing with this input one of this. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I meant to mention this. Going into the sound, there's the AND gate, but it looks like it's going to be stored. There's also like interrupt. Right. So it's just going to be zero. Actually, um, and that reminds me because you asked me, I think last class, to put up the auto diagram that doesn't have the interrupt hardware. And I did that. Okay. So your question reminds me to tell everybody that on Canvas, there's the Otter architecture diagram that's like the one that we have on the hard copy. But then right below that, I put another one that is the same diagram but doesn't have the hardware for the interrupt. In ranks. Yeah, so if that makes it easier for you, yeah, look at that. Okay, okay but let's get back to this instruction here, this AUIPC. So what is this instruction? You're looking at the description, what does it tell us? Yeah, and specifically it adds the upper immediate. Okay, so add upper immediate to PC. Where else, like what other instruction did you see that upper immediate? Right, the LUI instruction, right? LUI load upper immediate. Okay, well, this is add um, upper immediate to PC. So it's going to sum the immediate value and the current value of the program counter and store the result in the destination register. And it all does, and also does shifting of 12 bits to the left of the immediate. And instructionally modifies the registrate uh, the destination register. So what is this T1? Register seven. Okay, it's register. Well, actually, is it register seven? Because isn't register seven T2? Okay, it's register seven. All right, but is this a source register, a destination register? What is it? All right, it's a destination register. Okay, this 80 is a immediate. And then what type of immediate do we have for 
this instruction U type. Yeah, it's a U type. And again, the way you find out is in the description right by where the machine code is, it tells you what type. So this is U type. Okay, so now let's go ahead. Oh, also, we're going to assume that the program counter is at 24. Okay, so I just pulled that 24 out of the air, but what is that number coming out of the program counter? What does it always have to be divisible by? Four. Four, right. So I just pulled a number out of my head that was divisible by four. So there's nothing special about that other than the number, divisible by four. Okay. What's that? Or a number. Yeah, just a number. Yeah. Okay, so that's where we're going to start with our data diagram, uh, our data path. Okay, so what do we want to have happen here at the memory module? We want the memory read enabled to be one, just like we've seen many times before. And then at the time of the zero to one transition of the clock, you're going to get the instruction here in the CL1. Okay, and then we go to a reg file. So what matters at the reg file for this instruction? The right address, right? Because we don't have a source, right? We don't have a source register, either one or two. So we don't care about address one, address two. Again, there's going to be data there, but we don't care what it is. Okay, so we care about what's on the right address and what's going to be the data there. A six. The address of register six is six. Okay, we have an immediate, so the immediate generator matters. And as you told me a moment ago, it's U type. Okay, now what else matters in this instruction? Um, well, before we get to that, because what what is this instruction doing again? Adding. Right, it's going to add this immediate to what? The PC, the current, um, the current address at the output of the program. So you see how we have this connection that goes from the output of the program counter to this mux here. Right, so that's the two things we want to add. We want to add the 80, right, the immediate to the current program count, which is 24. And where's the adding going to happen? In the ALU. So what are we going to make ALU fun equal in order for it to add? Zero. All zeros. Okay, now to get this 80 to the source A input of the ALU, what do I have to do this here? That's going to be a one. Okay, how about down here at the other input of the ALU? What does this have to do? A three. Okay, so then these two are going to get added together. So what's going to be at the output? What data is going to be at the output of the ALU? Because what are we adding again? Which is one of four. So we have a 104 in here. And then what are we going to do with this 104? Right. right. It's going to be written to reg file six. Right. So it's going to go into input three of that box. So what does this have to equal? A three. And how about reg right? A one. So once that becomes a one, once we get the zero to one transition of the clock, that's when the data. Oops, did it wrong color. That's when the data 104 will be written to register six. Okay. So does that all make sense? Oh, wait, we didn't finish. All right, we got to get ready for the next instruction. So also what's going to happen, what we've seen many times before, right? We're going to go to the next instruction of the program. So PC source has to be zero again. And this PC rate has to be one. Okay. 
Okay. So any questions on that diagram? Okay. So these two instructions of store and also, and by the way, you have store byte, you have store tap word. What's the only difference? Is there going to be any difference in the data path that we did for that store word command? No, it's all going to be the same. The only thing that's different is these bits here, the size. Right? Remember how we talked about these two bits of the machine code instructions, bits 13 and 12? Determine whether it's going to be a word, a byte, or a half word. But you know, the red line and all the blue control signals, that's all the same whether you have a store word, a store byte, or a store half word. Okay? All right, you want to take a picture? People that want to take pictures. I'll erase it after you have a picture. Okay, and just like previous instructions that we've done. These two instructions only require two clock cycles. Okay, because basically, and we'll see in more detail when we get to the timing diagram, but basically it's a clock cycle to get the instruction at DL1. That's called a fetch. Right? Remember we talked about in the FSM, we have a fetch state. Well, what's happening in the fetch state is you're making this equal to one, and that gets the instruction at DL1. And then there's a clock cycle from when the instruction appears at DL1 all the way through any ALU processing, all the way through you know writing to a reg file or writing to you know a memory location. All that happens within a clock cycle, and that's the execute. Okay, so every instruction that we've done up to this point, two clock cycles. But now we get to a load instruction. And you're going to see load instructions, whether it's load word, load byte, or load half word, requires three clock cycles. So it's the load instructions that require three clock cycles. And we're going to see why. Um, uh, when it's the only the upper, it's like the oh. upper immediate, what like, oh, does the U like A hit? I'm glad you asked. Yeah, I forget to point that out. Is that you know? I think what you're asking is where does the 12 bit shift happen? Okay. Well, it happens right here in the immediate generator. In fact, the other command that we talked about, the LUI, the load upper immediate, it was the same thing. The 12 bit shift happens in the immediate generator. I mean, if you look at the U type format, you'll see that the least significant 12 bits are zeros. So that's what's doing the shifting. Yeah, so it happens here. So yeah, I'm glad you asked me because I forgot to mention that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right, so is it okay if I erase this so it can go on to the load instruction? Okay, erase it. All right. I erased this connection. We're not going to need this connection for load anyway, but. All this. Okay, good. So I didn't miss anything. Take it to that. Well, I don't oh, yeah, thank you. I can the PC out. Oh, thank you. Okay, how does that look? I think it's good. Okay, so let's look at this instruction here, load word. So what does load word do? You've used this. 
you use this in your software programs, right? The contents of the source register to the destination register as a word. Okay, and then what's happening here? Adding a zero to it. Okay, so it's going to add whatever is out here for the contents of this register. It then uses this as an address and takes the data at that address and puts it into this register. Right, so it's, it's sort of like the opposite of a store, right? With the store, you're taking data at this register and writing it to this address. Here, we're taking this address and taking the contents of that address and putting it into this register. Okay, so what do we have here uh, as far as destination register, source register, and things like that? Like, where's the destination register? T zero is the destination register, and T zero is what? Uh, what is that the alternative name for? What register? That's X five. It's thank you. How about F zero? This is R S one. And register what? Eight. What's the zero? Immediate. And what type of immediate for load? I type. Okay, so now we're ready to go ahead and do the data path and the control signal. So let's start at the output of the uh, program counter. That's where the address of the instruction is. So, what do we want to happen here again? Read enable one to be high. Right, read enable one to be high. <clears throat> That's going to put the instruction at the output DL1. So what's going to matter at the reg file? What inputs? Address 1 matters, right? Because we got an RS1. Does address 2 matter? Nope, because there's no RS2. Does WA matter? Yes. Right. We have a destination register. What's going to be the data on address 1? Going to be five, eight, right? It's going to be eight. And then what's going to be on WA? That's going to be five, right? So that's the address of the destination register. Uh, we have an immediate. So the immediate generator matters. It is an I type. This is going to be uh, zero. Okay, now I didn't put the contents of S0. So at the output RS1 is just going to be the contents of register P. And so here, you know, when I put X and then the number, that means contents, right? When you just put the number, that just means the date of the address. So this is contents of register. Okay, so that's going to come over to this box. And then what do we want to happen with this immediate? To add it right, we wanted to add it here. So the contents of registry and the contents of, or the immediate they need to be added together. So again, that's going to happen in your ALU provided ALU fun is all zeros. And what do we want this AL ALU source to be? Source A zero. That's going to put the contents of register eight at source A, what we want this much to have to be one. Okay, that will put zero at this ALU input, then those two are going to get added together, which of course is just the contents of whatever eight is. Right, whatever the contents in register eight. And then that's an address. So you see, that comes over the address two of this memory module. And here we want to read, right? We want to get data from that address, right? Because again, a load instruction is opposite of a store. Remember when we had the store word, 
you had the address that mattered, and you also had data in that address, right? And in that case, we were writing to that address. But here, we're reading from this address. And this is a synchronous read. See how for address two, you can both write and read. Here with a load, we want to read. So we would want to make this read enable two equal to a one. But do you see the problem that arises? Because see, we want to read the data at this address. And then once that data is at DL2, we then want to write it to a destination register. Well, here's the problem. This is a synchronous read, and this is a synchronous write. And when something's synchronous, it depends on the clock. So you see the problem is, and this is why you need three clock pulses, is that with only two clock pulses at the second clock pulse, this output would get updated, but it wouldn't be written over to this register. What gets written to this register is the data that was on DL2 before this data got written to DL2. So you see, if you only have two clock pulses for a load instruction, that data that you want written to the destination register would never happen. The old data, the data that was here previous that would get written to the destination register. So you see, you need three clock pulses because you need a clock pulse to get the data at this address to be out too, and then you need another clock pulse to get it written to the destination register. Any, let me just finish here. And you see, that's unlike all the other instructions. There's no other instruction other than the load instructions where you basically have to go through these two things, the memory module and then the reg file. If you look at all the other instructions, it doesn't involve, you know, that we're writing to a reg file. It doesn't involve the memory module like this one does. This is the only one that involves the memory module where we're writing to a destination register. How come you can't go straight through the mux above the reg file? Like, how can, why can't you go put the, put the input of that mux to, or the select of that mux to three? Why does it have to go through? Well, are you saying, like, connect this address to the mux instead of here? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, it's an address. It's not the data at oh, that right. address. Okay. Yeah, we want the data at that address. That's what we want to put in the destination. Yeah, another student in another class, and I wonder this too, and I don't know the answer, but um, I'll have to ask. Uh, I'll have to ask Dr. Hummel because he designed this memory module. But you know, a question I got in my one of my earlier sections was, well, why not make D out to asynchronous instead of synchronous, right? Because if it's asynchronous, as soon as that address is there, the data is going to be there, right? And that would seem to eliminate the need for a third state and a third clock pulse. And uh, like I said, I. I don't know the answer to that because I didn't design this memory module, but knowing Dr. Hummel and those of you that know him know he's a smart guy, there's got to be a reason why, some other reason, although I don't know what it is, but I'll have to talk to him why that has to be synchronous. Because I would think if it doesn't have to be synchronous and you made it async, that would make it where you don't need three clock pulses for a little. So, sorry. Because if this is asynchronous, you're going to try to read and write to it at the same time at some point. Let's see, when does that come up? You're just reading anyways. Oh, okay. So, like when you're doing a store, yeah. it would conflict with a store, is what you're saying. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Very good. Yeah, do you see what uh, month? Want to say is that because we can read and write to the same address, that's why it would have to be a synchronous read. Because, like, during a store command, when you go to write, that you're always reading, that would cause a conflict. That makes sense. Very good. Okay. So, what am I going to. Oh, so the next thing is here. Uh, on, on the board here, I just wrote in a concise manner what I just explained and know probably more words than what's absolutely necessary but anyway this is the concise way of saying that you need a third state when it's a load instruction see that's the solution the solution is add another state 
right? Each state is a clock cycle. So, you know, another state means another clock cycle. So, we're going to call this added state a right back state. Okay. And it's needed for load instruction. Don't need it for load instruction. And in our state diagram, it's going to go right here. And we go from execute into the right back only when we have a load instruction. If we don't have a load instruction, well, then it's just like what we talked about before. We're just going to go from execute back to fetch. Okay, but if we have a load, you go from execute to right back. And then once right back is done, you go back to fetch. All right, so you see how the, the state diagram is modified? Does that make sense? Now, one other thing that's really important is that when you have instructions that are just two clock cycles, well, in your execute state, that's when you set PC write to one, right? Because if you have any instruction that is completed in two clock cycles, well, after those two clock cycles, you want this to be a one because you want to move on to the next instruction. Well, if we have a load, see, this is for all other instructions other than load, all other instructions other than load, right? Because if I have a load instruction, do, you want, do I want PC write enabled in the execute state? No, why not? Yeah. yeah, I don't want to increment to the next instruction until I'm done with the previous, you know, the current instruction, right? And I'm not finished with the load instruction until the write back. So when you have a load instruction in the execute state, you want PC write to be zero. Right, because you don't want to advance to the next instruction yet. For a load instruction, you wait until the right back to make PC right equal to one. Right, because it's not until you're done with the right back that you're done with the load instruction, and then that's when you want to move on to the next instruction. And in the right back, that's when your data now at DF two comes over to uh, its input two of the model. So you would want this RF, RS, RF, WR select to be two. So that moves the data to the right data input of the right file. And then that's when you would want to make this a one, right? To actually put the data into the destination file. Okay. But the key thing and you know, it may take a little while to think about for it to sink in, and, and maybe uh, once you see it on a tiny diagram, say when you do your final project, but the key thing is understanding how in order to get the right data into the reg file, we need an added clock pulse, right? It all hinges on that you got a synchronous read here and a synchronous right here. Okay? All right, so any questions? So in the second example, would that basically be going from the data segment for S0? It's a uh, loading from the data segment? You're, you're talking about this load word? Yes. Well, I we didn't give a value like the contents of this register, but um, let's see, specifically the data segment, if you remember from, I think it was last class when we were, Last class, no, it was the class before that when we were talking about arrays. That specifically for getting data from the data segment, we use that LA command, you know, the load absolute. Now, you know, this example that we did for the store word, that's writing to the data segment. Gotcha. Right? We make this address 6,000. Yeah. Yeah, but for, for um, loading from the uh, data segment, we use that LA, which is a pseudo instruction. It's not a real instruction. 
Yeah, your real loading instructions are LW, LB, LH, and then also the unsigned version. They have like LHU and LBU. Yeah, LUI, the load upper immediate, that's not an instruction that requires three cycles. That's two cycles because we did that data path. That was the first data path we did. And if you look at that, it's on Canvas, you'll see that LUI doesn't involve the memory module. I think two cycles. When you're in execute, you want PC write to be zero because we don't want to advance to the next instruction until we're done with write back. I get that. How does the FSM know that it's a load instruction and should go? To oh, that's a great question. Um, based on, let's see, what was the activity? Was it last class that I gave you that activity? If we were looking at like various types of instruction. Oh yeah, the one I just handed back. So what are the, you know, it's a great question. And, and, and what do you have to look at to determine like what kind of instruction you have? Like, what did you do in that activity? What were you looking at? What fits? Yeah, opcode would tell you the type. And then once you get to the type, the function three bits would, you know, select out from that. Now, I actually will have another activity for you on Thursday, which delves a little deeper because some of the types, when you look at them, like for example, um, I type, and I think there's also an R type uh, example of this, that even when you narrow it down from the opcode code and then also the function three bits, there are a pair of instructions that have the same opcode code and the same function three bits. And for those pairs that have the same opcode code and function three bits, oh, I don't have it up here, but we have it on our diagram. If you look at the diagram, If you look at the diagram up by the control unit decoder, see how it's inputting bit six through zero, which what's bit six through zero? That's what I'm That's the auto. It's inputting bit 14 through 12, that's 14 through 12. That's the function three. And then look for the um, for the control unit decoder, it's inputting bit 30, right? Just a single bit 30 of machine code. And what we're gonna talk about on Thursday, and I actually have an activity for it, is that for those instructions that have the same opcode, same function three bit, they have a different bit 30. So that's how you distinguish between the pairs. You look at the bit 30. And one of the pair will have a bit 30 of zero, and the other of the pair will have a bit one. Okay, so, and, and there's other, you know, other examples similar to that. So. And you know, and I'll talk about this more on um, on Thursday. There's many ways to design both your decoder, your your control unit decoder, and also the decoder part of your FSM. Like there's there's many ways to design this, and that's where you spend most of your time in your final project. You know, there are people that just brute force it. You know, basically every instruction they just have you know opcode function three, and if they need the, the bit 30, they have that. But you can lessen the amount of code for those uh, sections if you look for patterns, okay? Like there's certain patterns, like there's certain instructions where, you know, basically all the control signals are the same, except maybe ALU is different. And there's different ways that you can, um, like concatenate bits together, where, where you can reduce the amount uh, of code that you have to write. Now, you're not graded on how efficient you are. So if somebody just brute forces it and basically has, you know, a bunch of code for each instruction and it ends up working, I mean, that's good. Uh, but, you know, the more code they have, the more chance for syntax errors, the more chance that, you know, things, you know, there'll be some silly mistake or something like that. So usually if people try to brute force it, they spend more time troubleshooting. But anyway, we'll talk about that in, in more detail later. Okay, so at this point, why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break till quarter past. And when you come back, I'll go through a timing diagram example. And then after that, you'll be able to do the activity, which is a timing diagram activity. Okay. <laughs>